Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the YVR Remo Show. Uh, today's episode is a big one. We've got some current events on our plate that we have to deal with. Everything from CMHC guidelines, rates again, what's happening in the marketplace, a tenancy act. Oh my God, there's so much there. And we are gonna do a special episode about the 5% hacks that I posted up on Instagram just a week ago that got a ton of response. So we're gonna talk about creative ways to build equity in your home, buy a second home, a third home, whatever, make money in real estate. That's what we're all about here. So again, I'm with my partner, uh, Derek Williamson, and I've got Dean Lawton with me today. I'm Alex McFadden. And if you're liking the show, make sure to share this with your friends, give us a rating, and just let us know. We'd love to hear from you. So enjoy the episode, and we'll talk to you guys soon. What's up, guys? You are listening to the YBR Remo Show, where we talk all things Vancouver real estate and mortgages, take boring topics, and make them interesting. Make sure to stay tuned to listen to everything you need to know how to put cash back in your pocket, create wealth in real estate, and simplify the complicated. Back for another episode, guys, in the saddle again. Here we go. Um, it's a beautiful Sunday night, but we're so dedicated that, or not Sunday night, what night is it? Holy cow. <laughs> it's. <laughs> It's a beautiful Thursday evening at 7.41 p.m. I can see the sun is outside. It's beaming, but we're dedicated. We're dedicated to the show and getting information to the people. They're asking for more. And so we're back again, at, back at it. And um, man, we got, some, we got some interesting things to talk about today. And uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of an update because so many things have happened over the course of the last 30 days. And we've done a few interviews. We've had some topical uh, podcasts. I think this one is going to be a little bit different where we're going to focus on what's happening right now in the market and what you guys need to know. But we're also going to give a breakdown into some 5% hacks that a lot of people are asking us about. So today, um, Derek, we were just chatting about this a minute ago. Uh, it sounds like the uh, BC Landlords, or I should say BC Tenancy Act, has announced that uh, the COVID restrictions around eviction bans uh, and other factors around Landlords and tenancy are being lifted, and we're going to pre-COVID tenancy act. What do you think, man? Yeah, it's interesting. It could change a couple different markets: the rental market, our housing market. It's uh, it's kind of too early to tell. I've seen some people posting saying that people can be evicted again, but it's it's really not that easy, right? You can't just kick people out of your house. You typically need to uh, basically take over occupancy. Like if you're the landlord, you need to actually say that you're going to occupy and then live in that house uh, or you have to do extensive renovations that used to be an easy out for a lot of people now you have to have permits from the city like it's not paint and and flooring it's a big job to get tenants out uh, or you can sell the home but like you said through covid there was a pretty much a halt on all of that which was very interesting because it it stopped people from being able to sell their homes because the tenant didn't have to move out. Um, it stopped people from being able to show their homes. Uh, so it's interesting. And, and I think, uh, Alex, you mentioned this, but we might see kind of a flood of, we might see a flood of listings, right? Because now people are in a position where they can sell and they can show their homes. So, uh, and you know, a flood of listings obviously changes supply and demand, which could change the housing market a bit. I don't know, we'll see. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Dean. What are your thoughts on uh, what we're going to see here? I mean, just touching on what Derek mentioned uh, with regards to the flood of properties coming onto the marketplace and the dynamic around landlords and tenants and probably playing that juggling act. I'm sure you've got some thoughts on how that could play out. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to a number of people that did you know, lose their job during COVID or you know, had some sort of financial stress and they are landlords. And so the idea of selling uh, a rental property is kind of the first idea when it comes to liquidating really anything in their portfolio so i think for sure we're going to see a flood of some property into the market um, but to derek's point like a lot of those properties have tenants some of them have probably really good tenants that don't want to leave and um, if you're a landlord you probably wouldn't want them to leave so it'll be interesting because um, there could be an opportunity where you could potentially pick up a really good investment property with a great tenant in place uh, from as a, from a buyer's perspective, right? So um, it should be pretty interesting to to kind of see what unfolds. And then obviously, you know, if you're you know if you're if you're a buyer looking for a home that currently has a tenant uh, in that unit, uh, you can still um, purchase that home and move in as long as you're going to make that your owner occupied home. So. Um, for sure. I know for a fact there are people that need to liquidate and I think we're definitely going to see a, a little flood into the market, at least our local market here in, in the lower mainland. 
Yeah, that's a good point. And on the flip side of, of that, you know, good tenants and then there's bad tenants and, and maybe it's not a bad tenant. Maybe it's just bad timing, but a lot of tenants have lost their jobs, right? It's not just the landlords, the tenants have lost their jobs. And through COVID, they didn't technically have to pay rent, right? And the seller, the owner couldn't sell the property. So now all these landlords that have tenants that have been laid off and they're not paying, you can only imagine they're going to be listing that property tomorrow, right? Like, because it's it's a burden on the landlord dramatically right now. And that's, that's just what we're thinking. One of the things whenever we're talking to people jumping into the real estate market as a first time investor or second time investor is that you are sometimes going to have to weather the storm, but this has been absolutely unprecedented. So you can't really blame somebody for kind of calling it quits if their own financial situation is under harm, which a lot of people are. But for, from an investor standpoint, you know, or for somebody who's watching this and telling someone who's getting into the investment market to look at you know buying investment property i mean it just shows you how important it is is to have that backup plan in place or have that contingency in place for six months and have it available have it readily uh accessible if you will an interesting thing about liquidating the market at a time like this like you suggested like if we see um you know a substantial increase in properties on the market aside from what we're going to see happen in the property market uh again there's going to be a lot of tenants that are likely going to be displaced so what does that mean for the rental market too does that mean our demand goes up there uh, and if so, what does that look like for the, the landlords that, that hung on at that time? I mean, I think there's gonna be a lot of questions uh, to be answered. And w one of my thoughts is that we've seen upward pressure in the Vancouver area and the Fraser Valley in a lot of different, not everywhere, but in a lot of different kind of uh, markets that in the real estate side. But what's interesting right now is we haven't seen, especially in the Fraser Valley, we haven't seen upward pressure on prices in things like townhomes and in many cases, condos, especially out, out in the valley, maybe in Vancouver. And if there's more townhomes and condos coming on the market, does that drive the pressure down? Because, I mean, we talked about this a lot in the last two weeks here. The, the number one thing that we're seeing sell is that single family detached home between what, 800 to 1.2 million, especially something with a suite. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting to see what happens. I mean, I think one of you, before we got on here, mentioned your guess as good as my guess. Um, it's true. Like it, it's super interesting to see what will happen because you could have a, a an investor that owns a rental property that ha maybe has one of those tenants that isn't paying rent due to COVID, and now it's just like, hey, I'm just selling this thing because I'm not getting paid rent, so I'm going to sell it. That same investor may flip that uh, investment right into another investment and then have a fresh new tenant that they can go find that actually is working. So there could be some strategies here where investors are getting right back into the market. This is just a way for them to quote unquote, get rid of that bad tenant or not, n not necessarily a bad tenant, but bad for them. Um, so it could be interesting to sure. see what kind of strategies come, come from this, right? Cause one thing we don't know is as much as you can evict, um, if somebody hasn't been paying rent, usually that's a reason to evict. But in this case, I mean, I don't know, it, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. Definitely is. So moving forward, obviously the big news the last three weeks in the real estate market and something that we're still seeing a lot of questions and tons of confusion about right now is about the CMHC guidelines. We talked about this in the past shows, so we won't spend too much time talking about it. But um, to this day, we were just talking about how each of us had seen posts on the internet and blogs today specifically sharing incorrect information. In fact, I brought it up to someone in particular and they admitted and unfortunately that it was basically a lead magnet so we're going to clear the air and let people know that the cmhc guideline changes that are projected at this point the other two insurers in canada are not following the reduction of the debt to income ratio they're not increasing their requirements for credit score and they're not eliminating the borrowed down payment we don't know how every bank is going to react but we've already been advised by some of the top banks and lenders that they're just going to if you don't qualify under their guidelines they'll switch it over to the other insurer and there's probably going to be some unintended consequences but you you could still buy and we should know that you should still be able to buy yeah, there's absolutely no pressure on that right now. And I think, like you said, it's it's uh, more of a lead magnet that some of the some people are posting or there's just simply not educated on, on what's going on in the market, which is unfair to buyers, right? Like nobody wants to be pressured or rushed into a purchase. It's the last thing you want to rush into. So there's other options. There's absolutely no, no need to rush. Uh, a, a kind of a fear, I guess, is because CMHC is a crown government corporation, uh, do they have the government support? Is there enough support to implement CMHC's changes across the board at some point and say, you know, as much as Genworth and Canada Guarantee don't want to follow 
Maybe they make that a regulation. Maybe they don't, uh, but that's a kind of a question that's been looming that nobody has an answer to, of course. Yeah, to that note, I think we're going to see some very interesting dynamics come out in the next month to two months. And, you know, if I'm honest with you, I would guess that we'll start to see the lenders find a little bit of a happy medium in, in between the current policies and the new policies and maybe just self-impose some things like credit requirements, maybe not the debt to income, but certainly the credit requirements. And they'll probably think twice about the board down payment, which we don't see a lot of anyways, right? Yeah, so, very, very all right, hard. well, that's enough of the CMHC rules. We've talked our teeth out. So the reason that um, that we brought that up is is the reason that we're going to bring up this episode of talking about 5% down and, and some myths and confusion and hacks if you're looking to build your wealth in real estate and, and basically explain how it all works. But before we go into that, I think I just want to quickly touch on uh, what's happening in an interest rate environment right now and with so many levers right now in uh, in play that are impacting interest rates. Like I, I can't even believe it every single morning I look at my inbox and I'm seeing you know three to five lenders big lenders every day you know rates are coming down rates are coming down and it's a trickle like it's not like a big jump but it's a trickle down and the neat thing is I mean we filmed that episode last week on HSBC's low rate basic offering or low rate offering I should say and we're finding all the uh, other uh, non-bank institutions are coming down but they're coming down with their full feature products which is really really cool so that's awesome as a consumer um, what are you guys uh, suggesting uh, people do right now if they're kind of on the fence and try to wonder what they should do as far as interest rates are concerned um, 100 percent recommending a variable rate term um, just so you can weather the storm we do we all really do expect the interest rates to drop especially on the fixed rate side we talked about this on one of our last episodes that the fixed rates are actually sitting a lot higher than they should based on where the bond yield is and uh, we're not going to touch on that again but the fixed rates in in summary will be coming down it, it, it has to happen so if you take a variable rate term you have the ability to at least uh weather this for another six months potentially and then hit the rock bottom of the fixed rate if fixed rate is really what you want uh, you can look to lock in later uh, and and there's no cost to doing that when you take a variable yeah the variable play is is definitely a good one right now um, especially right now because predictions are that the bank of canada won't be raising interest rates for probably between two to four years and it really depends on how our economy reacts to what's going on due to covid um, but typically if there's no Bank of Canada rates, variable rates will not climb either. So everybody going into a variable always thinks about this looming risk of what if rates spike, right? Well, you have a pretty good certainty that you're going to be in a very low rate with no change, at least no uh, upward change for at least probably two to four years, um, which gives people a lot of comfort going into that. And when you look at the savings, you know, even if it's a 0.3 or 0.4 difference between that variable and fix, well, 0.4 on $500,000 over three years is a huge, huge savings. And then the good part about the variable is you have the ability to lock that into a fix later if you want to. Uh, you can break it at any time with a three month interest penalty, right? Um, and then, you know, I have a lot of clients that are wanting to go fixed right now too, and they're just not comfortable with the variable no matter what I say. Uh, and the clients that are going fixed, we're just making sure that they're with the right type of lender right, where the penalties are not going to be as dramatic if they do need to change and just making sure that they have portability clauses in the, in the, the terms of their agreement with the, the lender. Yeah, it's, I think it's an interesting point to bring back, like why we're suggesting the variable and why we might see fixed rates continue to climb down. I was just looking at the statistics here and since uh, basically going back on April 15th, the bond yield, uh, the five-year bond yield in Canada hit 0.44%. Uh, and it, it steadily kind of hung out there, had a little bit of a dip there back in, in May to, to a quarter percent. And today we're standing at about 0.4%. So it's been pretty steady now over the course of uh, two months. Uh, typically lenders want to earn between one and a quarter to one and a half percent above uh, the bond yield. And that puts us today at one point, well, 1 1.7 to 1.9%, uh, generally speaking. So there's still room to move uh, for some of these lenders. And seeing as things have stayed the same for two months now, we might continue to see that. So the smart play is if you have a mortgage coming up in the next 12 months, probably worth having a conversation about uh, getting in and renewing early. Uh, if you have any rental properties, typically there's a there's quite honest, often a bonus on your rates. Can you refinance today? What can that look like? If you have, if you're buying a property, don't be so focused now now because rates are so freaking low you could pick the best 
product, which you should always do, but never have any stress around it. This is the bottom 2%. You, you can't, yeah, it's cheap money. So enjoy it while it's here, uh, folks. That is another thing that's fueling rates, which leads us into the topic of conversation today, which is, uh, I, I, I made a post, I'd say uh, two or three weeks ago, and all I said was, hey guys, a 5% down is still here. It's not gone away. And I had so much response to that one post that I started sharing a little bit more information about CMHC, uh, Gen Worth, Canada Guarantee, which is an insured mortgage guidelines. And I, I shared another post uh, about a week and a half ago about 5% hacks, uh, different ways that you can build wealth through real estate with your 5% down. Because I, a lot of people have this mindset, <laughs> guys, you hear this all the time, I need 20% down to buy, or I need 10% down to buy, or like 50, these random numbers. And it's just not true. Like all you need is the beginning down payment, assuming you qualify. There's reasons why you might wanna have more. So leading into it, basically the, what we're gonna talk about is a few different ways that you can utilize this 5% down and how it actually is an investment for you and different ways to, to think of it a little bit differently because typically the only thing that people actually look at is what, like the payment, I don't know, sometimes the payment, sometimes they look at how much they're spending on the property. I feel like people miss the whole scope of what they're actually doing here. Would you agree? Yeah, well, I mean, just back to the rate conversation, right? Everybody gets hung up on rate and, and some people, you know, they, that's their decision whether they want to buy or not. And it's like, you got to think big picture. You got to look at principal pay down. You got to think long term, right? And like buying with 5% down it can be kind of frightening when you really look at the numbers because you put your, you know, 15% or $15,000 down payment on a $300,000 property. You roll CMHC in there and your down payment looks like it's six or seven grand, right? Like a good chunk of that's been eaten up and everybody goes like, this is crazy, right? Um, but you got to think about big picture. Is it better than renting? Are you seeing appreciation? You're paying down principal. Uh, and then we'll get into some strategies that we've talked about, right? With purchase plus improvements and, you know, buying your next property and buying vacation properties and secondary homes. Well, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is what's the alternative to not doing it? You're you're essentially paying 100% interest rate when you're renting. So it's just you got to look at the alternative and weigh the options and, and, and make an educated guess. I mean, to me, if you have 5% down, like you're you're literally uh, you're literally paying 100% interest if you're if you're not going to move forward with that and buy a home. Right, right, so. right. And that's a good point. Now, and just to to be really clear, I mean, we're not suggesting that everybody should just buy a property just because and live somewhere they're super unhappy and and so forth. Like that's not where we're going with it at all. But I think what we're trying to do is explain, you know, how this is actually creating wealth for you and what it's actually doing, and 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 really break down some of the myths around that. So so like we're, I was talking to a client earlier today, and and they were mentioning. Um, so they took my advice, and we've been working together for a while. Anyways, we were talking to them today. And uh, one of the things that we spoke about that got them really interested was the fact that they could actually uh, renovate a property, live in a property, renovate it, spend some time uh, getting the property up to speed, uh, you know, build up some equity over the course of a few years and not only have uh, money from the equity growth, which is the increase in property value, but also put it on the mortgage instead of paying with a credit card or anything else, which at 2% interest rate uh, and for, you know, 25 grand at, at 100 bucks makes a lot of sense. Uh, Derek, maybe if you could break down, you know, how we're doing that with with what we call sweat equity to build some some wealth in your own property right off the bat. Yeah, one thing to like what you touched on is the cost. Like, there's no additional cost. The interest rate isn't higher to do a purchase plus improvements. You get the best interest rates, uh, and it's by far the most affordable way to renovate a home, unless you have additional cash, right? But we're assuming that you don't. A lot of people will use a line of credit or a credit card. Like you said, you know, you're borrowing at 2%, it's amortized and it's going into the home. So very affordable and it really makes sense. So I'll just kind of break it down in steps. So the first thing you need to do obviously is figure out your qualification, just like any purchase or mortgage, you need to figure out how much you qualify. If your mortgage broker tells you you qualify for a $300,000 mortgage, you can't qualify for the renovation money as well, right? It all has to be built into you, to your qualification. So once you have that kind of dialed in uh, and you found a property, you actually have to get quotes from a contractor. So if you want to do flooring and, uh, you know, cabinetry, that kind of stuff, uh, you have to get actual quotes from contractors, which then, you know, if, if we're going to get you $40,000, they need to equate to about $40,000 or more. Um, once we have the contractor quotes, we send them on to your lender. They review them and approve them. They might come back and say, no, we're not going to approve your hedges in the backyard because it actually doesn't increase value to the home. Right. Um, I've actually had lenders say that they won't 
finance uh, appliances because appliances can be removed from the home. So it really depends on what you're going to do too. It has to, it has to make sense for the lender and yourself. Uh, essentially, you know, you have the, let's say you have the mortgage approved. You have $40,000 sitting there. You close on your home. Now you have to find a way to get the work done. That can be tricky for some people because the bank does not give you the money and hope that you do the work, right? Because if you didn't do the work, the bank is now at a loss because you didn't increase the value in your home. So uh, once you've closed on your home, you get the work done. Some people will use, you know, borrow money from parents or use a line of credit or sometimes contractors will actually do the work knowing that they're getting paid after and we'll have a conversation with them to show them that the funds are actually in the lawyer's trust account. Um, once the work is completed, we get an inspector or an appraiser to go out there. They take a few photos, they look at the receipts, they make sure the work is actually done and the value is increased. Once that is done, the lender reviews that and then they release the funds back to you so you can pay back mom and dad or whoever it is that you borrowed the money from if that was the case. So that's kind of the steps is getting pre-approved, getting your quotes, uh, doing the work and then the, the funds are released back to you, right? So um, did I miss anything there? No, no, man, you just told us a story. I loved it. So <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. You brought it, you brought it right back. But um, it, it sounds like when you when you explain it like that, I mean, it sounds like a lot, but it, it's really just, it's just kind of step by step. Right. Um, yeah. I, I prepared a few examples, you know, before before chatting today of some clients and, and what I've seen done and, and how they've actually been really creative with this. But Dean, do you have anything else to add on the, the process side? Not, no, nothing more on the process side. It, like just to your point, it, it it actually is quite simple, and we do it all the time. And there's really no stress. It's a seamless process. And uh, yeah, I'd be interested to hear some of your examples. I got some too that are that are top of mind. But it's you know typically what I've seen is that a forty thousand dollar investment usually uh, nets you almost double uh, that investment in in return and value. So um, and what I mean by that is a forty thousand dollar investment into the home usually adds about $80,000 of value. So it, it's, it can be pretty significant in, in the right property. Well, let's put it this way. What are the hottest properties in the market? What are the hottest property types in the marketplace right now is a detached home with a basement suite. Now, if you ask an appraiser, I think they typically would say like, what is that suite worth? And you'll get your hair anywhere between 40 to $60,000 for like your average single family home basement suite, nothing too fancy. But the reality is, is in a market like this right now, when people need that to get a mortgage and it, and it will give them an extra $160,000, is your property becomes more obtainable like uh, for people. And it also becomes uh, much more marketable. So it's worth a lot more of that. And if you're doing the work, then it's gonna make the difference between not just selling a property, but selling a property for more. So, so I, I'm working with a few clients right now and one in particular, that's exactly what they're doing. So they're basically getting a quote from uh, a contractor. This lender allows uh, the work to be complete by anyone. Like they don't actually have to use that contractor. So um, the, the, the um, one of the applicants, the husband in this case is actually, uh, he's an electrician. Uh, so they're gonna save a lot of money and a lot of his friends work in the trades. So generally speaking, what, what they're gonna do is, uh, like they haven't done this yet in this scenario, but uh, they got a quote for about $30,000 to add a suite into a home that already basically has an opportunity to add that in. The cost for them to complete it, they actually only anticipate it's going to be about $15,000, uh, $20,000 20, or so if you add in those appliances. Now, I know the appliances are typically not included in the quote, but because they're doing it themselves, the sweat equity component really kicks in. So they're really building that investment component, they're going to be left with about $10,000 from that. And that $10,000 they can use from whatever they want. Their goal eventually is to actually buy a, uh, a second property as soon as they can. And so what they're actually looking to utilize that for in this case is to build out their money for their down payment uh, going forward. So, you know, we'll see how that works out for them. But at the end of the day, if you look at the fact they've got that cash set aside and now they're going to bring in the rental income that they actually didn't really need of about $1,200 per month, that's $1,200 a month worth of uh, savings that's coming in, uh, less some expenses, uh, plus the $10,000 they have set aside. So they're well on their way to starting to save up for their next property, which is kind of neat. Yeah, that's really cool. Another another really cool thing about this program is it, it really opens up people's eyes to what they're looking for. Like a lot of people looking for their first home or second home, like they want a turnkey renovated home or condo or townhouse or whatever it is. Like they just want to be able to move in and love it. And maybe you can't find that place or maybe it's overpriced, right? So it opens up your... Uh, your span of what you can look for and maybe you scale down your price point a bit but you know that you're going to have 40 grand to throw into this place right to make it what you want um, so I found a you know a lot of clients have really liked that component and it, it just gets their creative mind thinking right of what they can do rather than 
taking what the person before did and just accepting it, right? Um, and just a note that this can be done on any type of property. It can be done on condos. It can be done on co uh, townhouses, detached homes, and uh, multi-unit properties as well. We had a client up north in BC, actually. He bought a fourplex. He was living in one of the units. The other three units needed some work, so he he financed $40,000. He beefed them all up a little bit, so he increased rent on the other three units that he purchased. So that was pretty cool to see. Um, and like Dean mentioned, you know, doing 40 K if you do it properly and you do something that's going to increase the value of the home, uh, it increases your equity, right? So when you increase equity, that builds money that you can eventually access. So once there's enough equity in the property, you can pull it out and use that to maybe purchase your next property, right? If you want to kind of start building a rental portfolio. Well, one really cool example that I've, I've seen a number of realtors do, and I know we have realtors that listen to this show. Um, they've essentially taken like a, a rundown listing or a really old vintage home that they're listing. And then the, what they've done is they've actually taken like at advertisements of it and the, like of this program and put it in the really rundown washroom. And it's basically a picture of a brand new washroom. And when, you know, I mean, we're not doing open houses now, but back when we were doing open houses pre COVID, you know, people would walk through that home and be like, Oh, wow. Like here's a, here's a product that I could access and I could actually envision a brand new washroom here or a brand new kitchen etc so it's a pretty cool way to actually take this program and use it as a benefit to market properties yeah yeah it's a good way to educate people about what the opportunities are again there's building that instant equity there's derek mentioned obviously creating that investment potential and and increasing your your potential rent adding a suite whatever it is i think it's important to note that this is just quite simply a tool and it is also important to note this isn't just for five percent down uh, there are some programs, 5, 7, 10, 15, 20, et cetera, around. There are rules and stipulations. And it's actually also very important to note that uh, the, some of the stringiest lenders around this are the big banks. Uh, so we find that uh, the big banks are often not the right lenders to work with on these types of products uh, as far as just smooth and uh, sorry, smooth process and just opportunities to really help build the wealth through this. So let's let's move on to uh, one of the topics we were talking about before, which is a common misconception around the ability to purchase a property that's your second property with 5% down. And this is one of the, I don't wanna say oldest rules in the, uh, the book or one of the oldest tricks, but this is something that we don't even think about, but a lot of people are not even aware that this is a possibility. So commonly when we talk to our clients about, you know, buying their second property or continuing to move up to the, the next, you know, the property ladder, one of the conversations we have is about keeping their primary residence. What would it look like for you in three, five, seven, ten years from now if let's say let's just say five years, if your property today is worth five hundred thousand dollars and in five years time using two and a half percent, and I've got it listed in front of me, and using two and a half percent appreciation, that property is now worth five sixty five. And the principal pay down over that timeline is with the four hundred thousand dollar mortgage, for example, is is seventy five grand. You got now got one hundred sixty five thousand dollars of built in equity. So 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 basically, you're making money, and you didn't have to let go of your primary residence at the same time. What if you could take the equity that you built in your primary, keep it, rent it out, and then buy the second property? And it's something you could do. And a lot of people struggle with that because when they refinance, which you can only borrow up to 80% of your property value, they don't have 20% to put down on the next property. And they think that's a bad thing. We argue that it's not that it's a bad thing or a good thing, but it should be considered because a lot of people would actually do this if they knew about it. They just don't get told about it. So 5% down isn't just for your first home. It can be for your second home. And if you're moving into it, especially you should be considering it. What about What are your thoughts on that, Dean? Oh, 100%. It, it's... A lot of people are surprised to know that you can buy a second home, a vacation home for uh, just a minimum 5% down. I've been talking to a number of people pre-COVID again uh, that were looking in Arizona, Palm Springs to buy their vacation home. And, you know, down in the States, you're probably looking at a minimum 20, 25% down just to buy a property down there. Uh, and so... It's funny now because of COVID, people are like, well, I don't want to buy in Arizona. Like, it's a little crazy. I don't want to travel, you know, so on and so forth. But um, so now they're looking in t towns like Kelowna and in the interior and, you know, some of these vacation homes uh, that are vacation areas in, in our province. And, 
you know, so there's there's now two reasons to look. Okay, one, um, people are afraid to travel, but two, I can actually buy this vacation home with a lot less down than I would have had to to buy in Palm Springs. Um, yes, it's a completely different area, different lifestyle, but uh, it's amazing how much the vacation market has picked up in our province because of COVID. Uh, like, it's almost impossible to get a campsite. It's almost impossible to get an Airbnb in, in some of these towns that are close to us, like Kelowna, like Whistler. Um, so it's it's amazing that uh, you can get a really, really great vacation property for just 5% down. And that really shocks people to know that. So, you know, whether it's COVID or not, there there, there may be an ability to get into the, a, a vacation market that you had no clue you could. Your strategy to, you know, potentially refinance a home that you bought five years ago with minimum 5% down. I mean, that's a that's a fantastic strategy if, if you could take advantage of that and you are in a position to carry a vacation home, it's a no brainer. But you know, there, there are some things to look out for when you're buying a vacation home. And, and, and one of those, uh, especially when we're talking about this 5% down program, there are some property types that would require you to put a little bit more than 5% down. And, and what I mean by that is there's, there's a, designation in in Genworth we're, we're referring to Genworth which is uh, the competitor to CMHC so the insurance component kind of dictates what we can and can't do here and when we're looking at a vacation home compared to a second home there are some stipulations that would require you to potentially have to put 10 percent down opposed to five and usually what what that is is if the home has seasonal access so you can't access the property say in the winter that's going to probably require a 10% down payment. Um, and, and But again, even 10%, in some cases, a lot of these properties are quite lower uh, or quite uh, easier to get into from a price point. They're not, you know, we're not talking about million dollar properties here. In some cases, depending on the town, they're as low as $300,000 to get into a, a property. So 10% down still, uh, in, in most cases, isn't something that's going to stop someone from, from moving forward with uh, with a transaction like this. Yeah, so I think we should be, uh, there's a clear distinction in the two different things that we're talking about here. Dean, what you were referencing there is the possibility of keeping a primary residence, refinancing, and then adding a, a second home or a vacation property. And whether you're living in it or, you know, long term have family members uh, moving into it, whatever that is, uh, a fantastic idea. And it's something that we brought up on the show a few weeks ago, which Jamie Garbutt uh, brought up the fact that he had that for four years. And it wasn't for him. But we've talked to a lot of people since then that say, no, that, that I think that is for me. So again, understanding who you are is really important but again, it's knowing that it's a possibility is the key and that, and that it is there and so um, another point about that vacation home thing that I should bring up is that a lot of people don't think of the fact that maybe maybe you live in this home for three years four years when you buy it you should buy it with an understanding as to could this be rented out one day could I rent out a room in it could I rent out multiple rooms what does that look like because then there's the their vacation rental the Airbnb component down the road and that's certainly something that people should should think about. Uh, Derek, any thoughts on the uh, vacation uh, component or the second home component? No, I was just going to add to what you said about the, you know, future down the road, you know, obviously you buy these properties with the full intention of, you know, using it for yourself and your family, but um, Airbnb is growing so dramatically nowadays, especially if you're, if you're buying something in a location, where it's a vacation for you, it's probably a vacation spot for other people too, right? People want to go do a week getaway or two weeks or a weekend. Uh, and if you're not able to use it all year, which clearly you're not, right, or that would be your primary residence, maybe it makes sense to open up to Airbnb down the road, right, after that purchase. So that's a really good idea. It's 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 amazing cash flow. And from my understanding, I don't personally Airbnb, but I know a lot of people that do. Um, it's really actually not a lot of work. Yeah, but it, it's important to know where you're buying too. With James Garbett, he he, you know, there there was a great example when he was on our show that he actually got restricted from moving forward with the Airbnb. Uh, potential because of the strata that he was a part of. So it's important to know where you're buying. And then it's also important to know that uh, you have the financial capability of, of just buying it for the actual intention. If the intention is just a second home, uh, just making sure that's financially uh, suitable and, and doable for you um, because there always is that risk where, hey, the great idea of doing the Airbnb down the road it's an awesome idea. People make a ton of money doing that. In fact, people rent out their homes for a minimum of two months uh, weekly, and it's paying their, their mortgage for the whole year. But there always is that risk that it could come to an end because of the strata, right? So 
Yeah. Uh, so on that note, going back to the, uh, so that that was a fantastic breakaway. The other thing that we talked about was the possibility of, of renting out your primary residence. So keeping your primary that you own today. So if you live in a condo right now, uh, refinancing that condo, taking that, you know, let's say 40, 50, 60, $70,000, and now applying that to the purchase of your new home is a fantastic way to start building that your portfolio that way. In fact, I've talked to people who have who have done this year over year over year for for uh, three or four years during you know a hotter market. Thankfully, they were uh, riding that wave, if you will, when the market uh, was increasing. Uh, one guy in particular comes to mind, and uh, for three years straight, he uh, he bought a home. Uh, no doubt, it started this in 2016. Uh, three years straight, um, I think maybe it was 2015. But anyways, um, each year he bought a home at five percent down, and uh, by the end of the next year, he had built enough equity that he could refinance that, pull the equity. He bought an ad- another one, uh, and he did that three times in total. Uh, he's still in his third property to this day right now. But I wouldn't be surprised if I get a phone call if he's listening right now uh, to do this again. And so uh, I think it's important to note that like CMHC's guidelines are pretty clear. You got to be buying the property for the purpose of living in it, but there's no clarity on living it for five years or seven years or 10 years. Uh, as far as we know, as long as you live in the property for at least a year, you don't have to uh, pay back the property transfer tax or anything, but like you could have a medical emergency. Something could happen to you. At the end of the day, it's all about intent. And while we won't advise someone to do it one way or another, you, you just should know there's nothing limited to you. There's no one locking you down to living in that property for four or five, six years, which is something I hear about uh, quite frequently. I don't know if you guys hear that at all. You mean, um, yeah. you mean that, like somebody changing their mind? So having the full intent to buy as a primary residence and then changing their mind two years later and turning it into a rental year is what you're. No, I mean, I think I, I think what I hear often is like people say like I actually only want to live there for maybe a year and then I might want to rent it out. Like I I, sh- I can't do that because I'm going to pay for CMHC or you know this thing. And and to the reality is is like well no there's there's nothing stopping you after a year to to move out or or whatnot like what if you bought a place like i know of someone in particular right off the top of my head that bought a place in langley and and they lived in vancouver they tried it out for a year it didn't work out very well and they ended up just renting out their place and, and actually just renting in vancouver where they lived and it's a win-win because they're still building equity in their house they have a renter paying off their mortgage and they're just living close to their work so that that you know that's something that they didn't think they could do like he actually called me and said like hey i think i have to sell my home um because i'm moving out because of the cmhc thing but we explained to him no you don't have to do that so so i certainly do hear that from time to time yeah it's a good point definitely i think i think that's the biggest thing is like shit changes right people change their mind life happens i had a client that bought a place and it didn't make sense for her to continue living there because of work and financial reasons so she moved in with her mom and dad and she rented her house out and she's actually cash flowing and doing pretty well on it right so i think you should always go into your purchase with the full intent as to how it's being presented always but stuff changes and and you know the lender is not going to take the mortgage away from you if it's you know done with the right mindset well it's so true like so much can change like for example i think alex you have the best example i saw your wife post on instagram the other night that your view is gone (laughs) all of a sudden some big townhouse got built up beside you and your view is gone so (laughs) but it's 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 true right like things happen that are completely out of your control and now it's like oh you know this beautiful patio that we love and we love this you know mountain view is now gone well that might trigger you to change your 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 living situation but you have a great property still that would suit an awesome renter. So are you trying to tell all the realtors in the world that I might be moving soon? Uh, <laughs> yes, actually, it is something we have considered. And it's a, it's it's so true. You're right. Like you buy a property and you might love it. But why lose out on that equity uh, that you've built or grown or you potentially could earn long term by selling it off? Like my property hasn't really increased in value over the course of a year. Um, and so I'm not going to sell it and I'll get creative and figure out a way to, to keep this property long term and make sure that it makes sense. So, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, one, one last topic that comes up a lot, and this is a little bit off the cuff here is is and, and someone uh, it was uh, Dan Henderson uh, replied to me on Instagram today and he asked a good question and something that a lot of people don't ask. And uh, let me just pull up the uh, specific question from Dan. I'll read it on air because uh, he made. He may appreciate that. Sorry for the wait here, guys. So uh, basically the question he asked was, you know, what do I do here? Because the more money, should I be putting more money down on my down payment? Because I think the market is constantly moving. 
does it make more sense to buy with less down it's, maybe in an area uh, outside of where I want to be or keep saving to be where I want to be. So basically he's talking about the market outpacing his ability to save, which is something a lot of people don't realize or think about. I've seen this happen time and time again. Uh, what do you guys think about that? What, what, what would you be your recommendations to him? Again, the thought process to be more clear is, is in his mind is do I put more money down or do I keep saving up more money um, uh, with the market constantly moving and trying to get that more extra down payment money? Um, or do I do I find some kind of happy medium and move somewhere where it's less expensive? Like, what's the balance there? Lifestyle, to be honest, like if if moving to get that bigger home that you want means an hour travel to wherever you work, it's just what are you willing to give up, right? It just really comes down to your lifestyle and what you're willing to to do. I mean, it's it that's a hard one to answer because not everyone has the same mindset not everyone has the same job of course and there's just a lot there's a lot there my personal opinion um if it meant getting into the home that i really wanted for my family like i i have three kids townhouse wouldn't work for me in 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 vancouver or a condo in vancouver wouldn't work for me so i'm gonna live in in the valley and have a bigger home um and i i i've built my lifestyle in, in a way where i don't need to travel to vancouver so it, it just really comes down to your lifestyle i think and, and what you're willing to sacrifice yeah, it's a fair point. The other way I also take this question after thinking about it a little bit deeper is just like, uh, there are some people who are having a hard time literally just saving up the money at, at all and what that looks like. Um, and there's, and this is where we've, we've done episodes on this and we'll probably go back and do more, which is how do you come up with creative ways to come up with cash? You know, some people are waiting to get that 20% or, or having a hard time even getting the 5% and we'll, we'll come back to that. But certainly, you know, conversations should be had with family, friends. I, I had a very creative conversation with someone today and, and their concern was having the cash. Like they've got the, they've got the, um, uh, the savings and he's talking about bringing an equity partner, someone to help him uh, through the process of uh, buying a property and coming on title to share ownership of it. And that's something we're going to see a lot more of in Vancouver and we'll probably uh, have some ep episodes later talk about joint ownership and, and joint tenancy. But uh, Derek, is there anything else you have to add on that one? Well, I heard something kind of, I don't think I have much to add to what you and Dean mentioned, but when you asked that question, I heard something different and I'm, I'm, I have a couple of clients that are in a, in a position like this right now. And, you know, one guy has 20%, like he has the money to do 20%, but he qualifies to do 10% down. And his question is how much should I use to put down? Like, where does this make sense? Right. And I'm, of course, I'm telling him there's benefits if you can get to 20% down as longer amortization, there's no CMHC, but for him, he's heavily invested in the stock market and he pulls in very, very good returns on his money. So he's actually elected to do a, l a lower down payment, pay the CMHC premiums. And he thinks that he can make up that difference with his other 10% down payment invested in the stock market in the next six months. Like that's how dramatic it is, right? That was what I heard when you asked that question initially. So I was going to bring that up. So again, it's case by case, right? Of course, if you can hit 20% down, it makes sense. But what are you doing with that money, right? If it's going to sit in a mutual fund or an RSP with your bank at one and a half percent probably makes more sense to put it down on the property. No question. No question. I think that's key. Dan, thanks so much for responding. Really appreciate it. If you're listening, let us know if that helped you out. Um, hey guys, this is good, but it's sunny out. Let's go for a run, get some fresh air, enjoy the night. Uh, guys, I, we hope you enjoyed the episode tonight. If you're still listening along, a little nugget for you. We're going to be doing a little bit more of this uh, episode. So if you uh, have questions, please send them to us direct on Instagram at Thrive Mortgage Co. Uh, you can also uh, send us on DMs on, on Instagram at uh, the Dean Lawton, Derek Williamson uh, with a Y, Derek Y, and uh, the Mortgage Pug here. So follow us, like us, share us, let us know what you guys think about the show, share it with your friends. We do this for, uh, for fun because we like doing what we do. So really appreciate you uh, listening and we'll catch you guys soon.